Welcome to Unmiked, a video series that blurs the edges that connect the world of opera to just about everything else. My name is Joe Spector, and I'm the President and General Director of Arizona Opera. As a kid who grew up in Miami, Florida, with dreams of being a hard rock star when I was an adult, and who later ended up picking martial arts up and training in that for a big portion of my life, I have found those previous dreams and passions feeding into my everyday leadership of this opera company, Against All Odds. The idea of Unmiked, you know, came from this notion that really disparate lifestyles, passions, hobbies, experiences in a world that's totally unrelated that connects to the world of opera so that we can bring together people from these different lifestyles through this really wonderful art form. During each episode, I will be joined by a recognized professional from the opera field and a professional from another field who engages in a similar work to demonstrate just how the elements of opera are the elements of our everyday lives. Welcome everyone to the first episode of Unmiked, uh, our Arizona Opera's new video series where we find the blurry edge between the world of opera and just about everything else. We have two really wonderful guests here for our first episode, uh, Alex Lacamoire and Clint Borzoni. Uh, Alex is an award-winning music director, arranger, and composer, best known for his work on Hamilton, Dear Evan Hansen, and In the Heights, and Clint Borzoni is an award-winning composer of opera, best known for his work on The Copper Queen, Arizona Opera's second world premiere commission, When Adonis Calls, and My Life as a Bald Soprano. Uh, thanks so much for being here, guys, and for being the brave souls to step into our first episode of this new series. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm happy so, to be here. Uh, the idea of this series is that in each episode, we will have an accomplished professional from the world of opera uh, and an accomplished professional from another world. And we'll find the overlap between those two spaces and hopefully create some dialogue where we can hear about what's similar, what's different, and uh, hopefully at the end, uh, discover that opera is a little bit closer to, to all of us than we might have thought at the beginning. So uh, Alex is our non-opera guest. Uh, numerous talents as a music director, arranger, composer, and I will add to this uh, prestigious list of accomplishments, he is also a really great friend. Uh, we've known each other for 34 years. Uh, I, I don't know that that has uh, been the, the sole source of his uh, accomplishments for winning three Tony Awards <laughs> for best orchestrations, uh, three Grammys for best musical theater album, and additional Grammy for outstanding music direction uh, for his work on FX's miniseries, Bossy Verdon. Uh, he was also the recipient of his first, first of its kind Kennedy Center honors for his contribution to Hamilton. So cool, so cool. Um, uh, Clint here is, uh, as I mentioned before, our our opera guest. Uh, Clint has a special place in my heart too, because when I first came to Arizona Opera uh, four years ago, the Copper Queen workshop, the first uh, piano workshop of the entirety of Copper Queen was actually the, uh, was the first uh, artistic endeavor that I got to participate in as the artistic leader of this company. And uh, we've only known each other for four years, but uh, they have been uh, four really great years. And I'm so uh, proud and grateful to be associated with Clint. Um, th this is uh, a big year for the Copper Queen. It's not uh, Clint's only uh, opera to be sure, but it, I think it's the, the first opera that, uh, that you've created that will be produced for, uh, for film, is that right, Clint? Uh, yes, it is. And it's like my first real full length, fully orchestrated opera. Fantastic. It's not a chamber opera, so. That's right, that's right. It is, it is uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a grand opera in a, in a small space. It, I mean, it's, 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 it's dense, it's rich, it's distilled. Uh, Clint has composed songs and song cycles for many leading vocalists and won Barra Hunk's Best New Song. You're going to have to tell us about that. Uh, best New Solo Work for Baritone, Opera Mission's Cabaret Song Competition, and he was a prize winner of Sparks and Wiry Cries, second and fourth annual uh, New York City Song Slam. Very, very cool. Additional honors include the Morton Feldman Award, the Boston Metro Opera Festival Award, and numerous artist residencies. Did, did I miss anything in there, Clint? It's, it's, anyway, it's so cool to have you guys uh, both here. 
So uh, the world of orchestration is, it was such a fascinating starting point to me because, you know, last night we were uh, listening to a, a performance of Arizona Opera's uh, studio uh, spotlight series. And we're listening to, you know, works from, you know, masterful composers of opera and, but we're listening to it in piano. And, and I think when we listen to works uh, in that fashion, our, in our ear is always, you know, what that sound world is that we associate. It's always a derivative experience. And so I, I wanted to start with what is the what is the creative process of orchestration for you? It, it's such a powerful uh, aspect of the expression of of music theater, music theater, opera. Um, how does that process begin? Do you start with the idea of a sound world already in your head? Um, does the music take you there? I I I really have no idea. So the and, and of course there's this piece of it. There's this act of trust that's involved when the composer and the orchestrator are are two different people and that's that is atypical between opera and music theater so so let's start with you clint where does orchestration come in the in the creative process when you're writing the piano vocal score is it already in your head how that sound is going to spread across an orchestra or how, how does it work for you i mean i personally love orchestrating while i compose so my very, very first opera in Sinos and Hadrian, I wrote it with a really small company here, Opera Mission, they commissioned it. And they gave me, do whatever you want. And I orchestrated it from beginning to end and then had to do the piano reduction, which I hated doing the piano reduction because nothing fits in the hands, it's all spread out. For the Copper Queen, you guys made me do a piano <laughs> reduction first. And I had to go back and orchestrate it and we learned that in college, it took several orchestration classes and they, that's what you do. You take the piano reduction and then you create the orchestration. So I found myself tweaking the score just a little bit, extending certain things because strings need more time to sound than a piano. And uh, in the copper queen, there's like, I'm a pianist. So there's lots of pianistic things that are not very good to just orchestrate, like running arpeggios. So I just realized that all that is just sound that stays there and I had to figure out ways to do that and I have like a really great friend um Philip Wharton he's an amazing orchestrator he's a great technician tactician and I said hey I'm trying to figure out what kind of ensemble to use and I kind of used him as a springboard for mm -hmm. that but mm -hmm. I personally would always love to orchestrate while I write so I know what the final product is and I don't have to go back and do all this tweaking and stuff like that that that's so interesting L and let me ask you this before we pivot to alex can you imagine writing a piano vocal score and then engaging an orchestrator to bring that orchestral texture to life can you actually can you imagine going through that process because that's because that's the way it works in alex's world no i would hate that <laughs> and, and that's that's what i thought you would say that's what i thought you would say and i, I have a feeling that it has to do with trust I have a feeling that, you know, can someone bring your artistic vision to life in the way that you imagine it? Uh, don't, I mean, don't let me put words in your mouth, but what do you, what do you think? I mean, it's, it, I mean, the, the major difference for me between opera and musical theater, and I love musical theater so much. I wrote one musical when I was younger and I never did it again, just because, I mean, even in opera, we have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Like you guys say, oh, I want this tweak, whatever. But in opera, I feel like I am in charge I mean, the librettist too, but from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece, it's all paced the way I want it to be paced. Like I'm doing all the acting cues. I'm telling the characters, giving them what amount of time I want them to do what they're going to do. And orchestration, even though it's such a pain in the butt, it, it, it's like, <laughs> I would, I feel like even if my orchestration might not be as clean as somebody else's or whatever, it's still my voice. So it's like my voice from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece. It's kind of mm -hmm. good but I don't know it's just it feels good to do it like that <laughs> well that well, let's pivot because I, I think you've, you've made an assertion here about that level of sort of involvement and in, in how the drama is spelled out does that does that first does that resonate with you Alex and then second if you can talk about talk about that talk about the trust that needs to be formed between you and a composer you're working with because I mean to me it's like 
I, I, it would be like, it would be like asking you to raise Sophie or Charlotte, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking about it, you know, we've created this thing and now like, you know, the, 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 the humility, but maybe it's more participatory than that. T tell us about that. Yeah, this is so fascinating already. Like, Joe, I love that you put this together because my, my head's already spinning with like, like joy and, and thoughts and ideas. You know, I think the first thing I would think of is that, uh, and, and, you know, I would hate to generalize or, or, or you know, uh, kind of like try to uh, put everything down into a sentence, right? But it seems to me that musical theater tends to be more about songwriting. Mm -hmm. And because of that, a song can sound so many ways. Right, you take a, a song that the Beatles wrote, and it could be covered by Frank Sinatra and sound a certain way. It could be covered by Joe Cocker and sound a certain way, and it could be, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Really, that what the basis of the song is, is a, a melody and some chords that could be changed and sound different. But yeah, I can see exactly how in opera you're writing a piece, so therefore the sound of that piece is all structured in the way it's orchestrated. That that's part of the sound of it. So yeah, I mean, it's you know, who would ever think to themselves, okay, I'm going to reorchestrate Mahler one or whatever, <laughs> and just like do another approach to that. That's the that's the second episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to think that uh, yeah, that you, you're therefore changing the true DNA of the piece, which is like a total uh, opposite uh, end of I think what. Uh, I think a classical musical uh, music and opera I is about, right? It's the voice of the composer, as Clint said, from the beginning to the end, which I'm so fascinated by. Because, yeah, it, it is rare to find someone that would do all of that. And yes, there are musical theater composers who, who do it all from beginning to end. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is Jason Robert Brown with this piece that he wrote called The Last Five Years, which is a 90 minute song cycle, really, which mm -hmm. he composed and he orchestrated. He actually played it as well. Like talk about total control, that, that's all there. So I, I, th that resonates with me as well in terms of feeling that you have a vision for the whole piece. And that's where I, I feel like that trust that you talked about, Joe, I, I feel very um, proud that I have that trust, particularly with the composers I've worked with. And when I think of someone like Lin-Manuel who is able to say, okay, yeah, go ahead and orchestrate it. And therefore I try to channel what I think he wants the song to sound like and be able to input my ideas and input my thoughts about, well, what if the backup vocals did this? What if the drums did that? Um, mm -hmm. I love that because my work in that sense is very reactive or reactionary or, or however you want to call it because mm -hmm. yes, I'm, I'm getting a piece of music and I'm inserting myself into it somehow but still knowing all the while that it is someone else's composition. I'm just a vehicle, I'm a conduit in order to make the things sound a certain way. And if it were anybody else doing my job, it would sound completely different. And it yeah. will sound different because one day someone will go out there and uh, be tasked with reorchestrating Dear Evan Hansen for the revival that happens in you know, 2040, should we be so lucky. Um, <laughs> and that just is how it happens. So people, yeah. uh, everyone kind of puts their own spin on it. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I love hearing Clint talk about how he would have this vision in his head about what he wants it to be. And, you know, no one else can really peer inside his brain, but him. So it takes that a process to be able to, to birth the song in that way. And, and that, that's amazing. I, I almost feel like, you know, locking you guys in a room with one of Clint's pieces and just like starting with the <laughs> piano vocal and just seeing, you know, like three hours you have to orchestrate. Let's just see what happens. Uh, so, so Alex, do you think you're, do you think your gift is more about interpreting what a composer is looking for and, and, and enacting what I was just describing as a joke between you and Clint? Do you think your talent is more that conduit type piece or do you also have an artistic voice that you think is your specific voice that is also embedded or, or maybe it's a combination? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination. As a matter of fact, my, the highest compliments that, uh, anyone that I know could pay me are my friends, people that I've known for years, but people like you, Joe, who are able to hear something that I've worked on and be able to say to me, oh yeah, Alex, that sounds like you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That Nothing makes me feel happier than knowing that there's something that I, they've known about my being as a musician that somehow speaks inside of the music. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, uh, one thing I always try to do when I orchestrate and arrange for that matter is I always try to storytell with the music. Because primarily, uh, again, that's what musical theater is to me. It's storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's what I go to when I try to think to myself, okay, how can I support what that story is? How can this music make sure that the lyric is heard, make sure that the moment is served, make sure that it feels um, like what we're seeing? Because there have been plenty of times that I've orchestrated something and I've missed the mark. 
and have either been too clever or been too bombastic or not have allowed a moment to speak in a way that, uh, um, uh, that felt true. And there were times that my orchestration would pull focus and then I would have to kind of strip down and find out how to make sure that that, that task at hand, which is making that story feel real, uh, that making sure that that task was, was, was forefront in my mind. No, that's great. So, so that, that feedback loop, you know, that's so important. And, and I think that's important for your work, whether you're working in opera or musical theater, you know, when, when you step into that world of being too clever or, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, what is that check? What's that check and balance look like for you, Alex? And then for Clint, because the, the, the act of composing an opera when you were the composer and the orchestrator together, uh, after, after Alex, I'd love to hear you, you know, just talk a little bit more about what that sounding board is like on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis. Is it work, you know, in a piece like the Copper Queen, you know, are you working with the, you know, with the librettist to say, have I hit that emotional note the right way? What is that feedback loop? So Alex, first, you, it sounds like you've had specific experience where someone said, too clever. I love that. I, I could easily imagine that. You're a clever guy. Tell, tell us about what that is. Well, I will say this. Um, I learned a lesson uh, early on in my career that uh, it's okay to have more ideas. And just because you contributed an idea in this collaborative process that I work in, um, that doesn't mean that you're a bad composer, or arranger, orchestrator, X, whatever that is. It's just that the idea that you presented doesn't resonate with the other person. Mm -hmm. And there've been so many times that I've been tempted to dig in my heels because I think my idea is so perfect and I think it's so right. And sometimes if you feel strong enough, you can make a case and they'll listen and perhaps they'll be, okay, just try it and then we'll decide. But more often than not, a first gut reaction from your collaborator is, is what it is. And they'll give, uh, if you have a good uh, person working with you, they'll explain why they feel a certain way, give you good descriptors and, and good reasons as to why. And then you have to have that faith that you'll be able to come up with another idea. Yeah. I'll tell a quick story. I, a, a dance arranger walked into a, uh, a rehearsal with an arrangement that he had spent hours working on the day before, this big thing, and he presented it and played it and, and felt great about it. And the composer said, oh, it's, it doesn't work for me because X, Y, and Z. And all that arranger did was throw up his hands and OK, great. What else can we do? And that was it. No question <laughs> asked, no, no fight, no struggle. He's like, OK, cool. So let, let's come up with something else, because he knew that there was another idea. And he yeah. wasn't afraid that his idea was the only thing that was going to save him or his arrangement or what have you. So yeah. that ability to just trust that, OK, there's another way to go. And the ability to recognize that it is about preferences. Yeah. I like this, that other person like that. One yeah. is not wrong, one is not right. I yeah. like chocolate, the other likes vanilla, whatever. It's like, right. but who has the final say? What are we trying to serve? And being okay that uh, there, there's gonna be another way to interpret something and it's not a reflection on your work or your right. ability. It's just like, okay, this other person just wanted to wear green that day and not purple. Mm -hmm. And it's not your choice to decide what they're going to be wearing right. after you serve. Oh, they want green. I'm going to give them green. Right. And at the end of the day, you don't know exactly, you know, who is right, who is wrong, what connected best until it's in front of an audience and they hear it and you can sense the frisson in the audience, you know, yeah. when that thing just hits. Yes. So, exactly. so, so Clint, what's, what's the, what's the feedback loop? What's that process for you? How do you, how do you check yourself? How do you find that? that that humble place where you know you thought you had something and you know whether it's that it was too clever i'm going to stick with that one whether it was too clever or something else you know you you have a you know a john cage reference and no one's going to get it why why is there a four minute and 55 second pause in the middle of copper queen you know whatever it is um what what is it who are the people you trust the voices you trust to 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 get course correction when you need it i mean Actually, Alex said something before that, was, that hit me. Musical theater is more about songwriting. And I was thinking, if an orchestrator said they want to orchestrate one of my songs, I would be a lot more comfortable with that than if they wanted to orchestrate the opera, my piano vocal. But maybe I'll have fun with this song. I, I'm interested to see what you do with it. But then the opera, it's like the drama has to be controlled from the beginning to the end. And then you're kind of trusting an orchestrator to contribute to that as well. But in terms of my checks and balances, I mean, with orchestration too, you have to be very careful because you're given all these beautiful instruments by all these people who could play them. And, you know, when you first start out, you just want to use everybody all the time. Oh, this sounds good. And there's really uh, 
my composition teacher and orchestration teacher, David Del Tredici, told me, you know, everything you can orchestrate is gonna sound good. Like you have an orchestra there. Whatever they play is gonna sound good. It's not gonna sound bad. You know, if they're all in tune, it's just not gonna be nuanced or even or, you know, so a lot of it is not just, oh, I have everything, I'm gonna use them right away. I or I'm not, I haven't used a trumpet in like 20 minutes, I better use him. And you have to see what the piece dictates. But I trust myself more than I trust anybody else, but I am extremely open to hearing what people say. And then I, and then I check, does that resonate with me or does that not resonate with me? Mm -hmm. Like Joe made us rewrite the whole freaking Copper Queen again. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, to be fair, I just thought it needed more Pianica, so. <laughs> Everything needs more pianica. Everything needs more pianica. <laughs> that that's a, no, that's fascinating, and I, and I think you have to have the courage of your conviction. If you're an artist, you know you do have your own voice, and at some point you have to trust your gut. I think even in any kind of leadership role and any kind of creative process, of course, you have to believe in yourself and and your voice, or it doesn't work. Um, so that that makes a lot of sense. That, that's. Um, I, I, I really, I have to tell you, it's, it's not on the list of things we were going to talk about initially, but you both have commented on what, a, what an opera is versus what a musical ooh, ooh. is. <laughs> and to me, this is one of the, the questions I have never heard an answer to that has totally satisfied me. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there are folks that say, well, you know, in an opera, the book leads the music, uh, the, the music leads the book. And in a musical, the book leads the music. A Alex, you said something today that I, I hadn't heard quite phrased that way before is, you know, about the songs. But but if you listen to La Boheme, I mean, that thing is nothing but tunes. Sure. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I've, and I've heard people say, and, and I have contested it, uh, and I, I think you and I even had this conversation, Alex, that that Hamilton's a music, uh, an opera because it's through composed. Uh, sometimes you hear, have this argument, it's, if it's through composed, it's an opera, but then what do you do with Carmen or the magic flute when they're done with dialogue? Uh, yeah, let me, let me ask, so let me ask this question. I mean, I'm going to challenge you to, to yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to challenge you, I'm going to challenge you both to like try to think of the, th I'm going to, and I'm going to try to shoot you down. I'm just warning you, this is the adversarial Joe coming out. Go, go, go. What, what is opera to begin with? Because for me, you know, if you put Broadway Bohem, you know, Baz Luhrmann's production of La Bohem on Broadway is, you know, and you, and you get, you know, singers that are mic'd, is it all of a sudden a musical because they're amplified? Uh, or if you, or if you put, you know, Brian Darcy James in there as shown art, is it all of a sudden a, a musical because it's done by a musical theater actor? What is an opera? How do you distinguish it from musical theater? I, I appreciate this is a little off the track from orchestration, but I'm, I'm, I always want an answer to this question. I've never gotten it. So uh, let, let's throw it in Clint's, Clint's territory first. <laughs> I, mean, for, I mean, I think the answer for me is the reason why I write opera is because I want to be in control from the beginning to the end of the piece. And with more musical theater, even if, even if it's through composed, there's songs, like Alex said, song after song after song with connective tissue. In opera, it's not aria after aria after aria after aria with connective tissue. It's like there's recit and there's this. And what kind, what I don't like is the book in musical theater because then you're not in control of how fast or how slow they say their words. And, but sometimes they have that in opera too where you speak. And in my opera, when Adonis calls, there's, a, there's, a, there's parts where they speak the text and I hate those parts now because I'm like, why did they take a minute and a half to say that freaking four, you know, sentence, those four sentences. Like that just ruins the whole pacing of my piece. The audience has been sitting there listening to you talk for like four minutes and I want this music to come sooner. So I, I think it's more about the pacing of a piece and who's in control of that pacing. If the composer's okay. in control of the pacing, I think it's an opera. Oh, interesting. I, I hadn't thought of it that, that way before. Alex, does that connect with you or do you have a different, a different view of it? No, that, that, that does connect with me and particularly about the, you know, I guess that holistic view, that's what I think of when I think of opera. Uh -huh. Like Clint described it perfectly. It's like this big, massive work 
that really kind of comes down to a shift of composure and what it created. And to me, I guess in opera, I think about all the different people that contributed to that because again, I'm in works where the choreographer comes up with an idea that affects what the director thinks, which makes what the composer do this, what makes me do something else. Or I, you know, there've been times that I've made suggestions about the lighting about something that affects mm. something and that will accentuate something that did in the music, which will affect, it, it, it's all, it bounces off each other. But one thing I talk about often is, um, what I suppose is what I think of the repetition within a song. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the best way I can describe it. I, I, an, a common complaint I hear often these days, when people see a musical and they don't like the musical, they'll say, oh, I, I didn't walk out humming the tune. And that's a big yeah. people say that. And my response to that is like, dude, back in the day for those songs that you hum, songs were 32 measures long. You repeated the A section three times because they were each eight bars long. And you, the amount of time that you spent living in the song was shorter and much more repetitious. Nowadays, it, you know, music and theater tends to be more pop based. So the verse itself is 32 measures. You don't even get to the chorus until much later. So mm -hmm. therefore the, uh, the amount of repetition that happens, the form of the songs within themselves is um, uh, yes, it takes longer now than it did before, but by and large, it's still a repetitive thing within the song where, something loops, something cycles, something repeats, something happens that hooks you in in that way. Uh -huh. And by no means I'm saying that opera doesn't have that, but I think the scope and the, the time between repetition, I think is much more spanned out and much more stretched out. And that ability to kind of hook into something is at a slower pace uh, for me. And, and that's, again, I'm not looking to generalize or what have you, but I feel like things are more compact in that way. They're packaged in much smaller uh, morsels. I think that it's a little, uh, um, as opposed to this big long scope and this long breadth of work. And, and that's where I see a potential difference. Yeah, so a I, lot of overlap, but there's a stylist, maybe it's just different enough in terms of that stylistic approach and that structural connection, especially to, to pop music, I can, I can really see that. You know, one of the reasons I brought you guys together on this first show is because you've, you've, you know, you've been exposed to each other's works. Alex was at our workshop of uh, the Copper Queen in New York back uh, about two years ago now. And, and I can, I'm, I'm sort of reflecting on that experience. I'm reflecting on the piece, the Copper Queen itself. And uh, what, if you were, let me, let me ask, this is, this isn't on the list either. I'm so sorry guys, but I got so excited of a nerding, nerding out about this conversation. If you were, if you were handed this piano vocal score, Alex, for, for the Copper Queen, you know, or, or maybe this already happens for you when you're listening to a piece like that on, on a piano vocal uh, sort of uh, performance. Do, are, you, are you all ready? Do you automatically go into that gear where you're hearing textures, where you're sort of imagining what that, what that is? I think for me, uh, in a sense, yes. I find that with certain writers, there will be things that are obvious. Right, there'll be things that you think to them yourself, oh, this is meant to be fortissimo and that line, oh, that has to be trumpet because what's going to carry that melody more than that X, Y, Z. Yes, if I were given a, a, a piano vocal score to Clint's beautiful piece, and by the way, Clint, I still remember getting a chance to watch that workshop here in New York and, and it was so wonderful. Congratulations on, on what's happening with it. Um, it, would, it would lead to so many conversations and so many questions and yeah. so many phone calls and emails and texts. What about this? What about that? What were you thinking when this happened? What do you want this to feel like? What's a good reference? Can you tell me a, an aria or a song or a movie that makes you feel what you want this moment to feel like? Right. Um, so there would be a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of kind of guesses on my end. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, a lot of trust, as you mentioned, Joe, about what that would have to be. But I would love to think that there would be certain things that would be like, oh, I have a feeling that I know what this would want to be just by looking at the notes on the page. Right. Uh, but good, that comes, you know, uh, suggestions and ideas and conversations. But yeah, at some point there would have to be some kind of, of, of uh, giving over, uh, which would be a very hard thing to do. I have a hard time doing that. Right. By the shows that I work on, I tend to not only be the music director, but I will be also the arranger and the orchestrator, sometimes a conductor, because much as Clint described, I have a, a sound in my head that I'm after. And I, that's, uh, um, you know, I, I want to try to make sure I have my eyes on every facet of that so that what I'm hearing in my head comes out through those speakers and into the audience and into right. their, their ears and their hearts. You know? Yeah, very cool. And, and I want to, uh, I, I want to just throw back for a second. I, that makes total sense to me. Um, it, it was interesting when when you came to the workshop, I asked you what you thought about the piece afterwards. And, you know, I was listening to, 
you know, to all those voices in there, because this is, you know, the, the, the act of commissioning an opera is its own sort of little act of bravery. You know, we, we, we obviously had been very connected to the Copper Queen and to Clint's work and to John's work, um, John De Los Santos, who wrote the libretto already. But, you, you know, you're looking for these um, outside sources of validation to give you confidence to take, take on the work because it's going to be time, uh, effort, and resources, and so forth. Um, but I remember specifically when I asked you, what did you think about this piece? You used that word, the same word today. You, you said, I, it was beautiful. And, the, and, it's, and it's so cool because when, when I think about the Copper Queen, I think about it as intense. I think about the character study sort of aspect of it. I think about the, 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 the sort of distilled nature of the drama. Uh, and, and then you came out with this like sort of just like this ray, this ray of energy, beautiful, which, which, it, which is also true. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that again today. Clint, what about you? What, from a reverse engineering standpoint, you know, if you're listening to the Hamilton soundtrack, does your brain does your brain say, you know, wow, I wish Alex had used more viola and satisfied, <laughs> you know, like do what do do what do you when you're hearing a completed piece, whether it's a musical theater piece, I suppose, or or an opera, do you find yourself reorchestrating? I mean, it depends on the piece. Like for Hamilton, it's done so perfectly, you don't the orchestration supports the work so you don't notice it and if you don't notice it it that means it's right mm -hmm. if you start noticing things that means it's all oh, why did he do that why did he do mm -hmm. that like with Hamilton it just hits you and you're not going oh there should have been this here or there should have been that there but like with bad orchestration you're kind of like oh what are they doing and you could always tell when somebody's just a little too excited and wants to use everything or wants to you know, oh, look at me, I'm gonna like really show my skills right now. And it's gonna be a whole trumpet section, then a whole brass and string section. So very rarely will I be listening to something and going Ugh, like that. Usually in pop music, you know, when they have those really crappy strings, like four strings and with the whole, <laughs> with the whole band, I'm like, why did they even do that? You can't even hear them. Like fair, that. fair enough, fair enough. So uh, while I've got you, Clint, uh, if, if you were to be, you say you've, you've written a musical before, uh, if, if you were going to be thrown into the world of, of musicals again, sort of what would your dream kind of project be that would be different from an opera project? Mm. And I would want to write something like Light in the Piazza or some really old school musical like My Fair Lady, uh -huh. or the music, something like that. I would love to do some, you know, really old school music theater like Gypsy, you know? <laughs> right, right. Where you'd get to lean on your your chops because there's a, there is a more classical nature to those <laughs> in, structurally. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, and what about you, Alex? You, you know, I'm waiting for you to write the, the you know, the, the next American opera, but I'm waiting, biding my time. If you were, if you were to write, be, be asked to write the dream opera project, uh, you know, the, the, the one of your choice, and, and understanding how you're defining opera in your mind, different from musical theater, what would that, what would that kind of project be? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. Cause it, something about writing a, a work that to my mind seems so massive, like that's scary to do. And that's why mm -hmm. I'm so in awe of what Clint does to be able to kind of like take that leap and stay in midair for that long. Because yeah. that's what I think about when I think about musicals. I, and as Clint mentioned, when the book happens, like you have these crests, you, you can kind of hop and then come back down and go into a song and then rest again and then rest. But again, with opera, yes, there's there's pacing, there's wretched in between, and it's not just aria, 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 but by and large, the lights go down and you start and you just stay on that journey the whole time and you have to stay afloat. And to be able to sustain that power and keep that interest and keep that flow and have it be paced just right. That's a hard task mm -hmm. and that's a scary thing to do. And so I, I'm so uh, uh, it, like fascinated by people that are able to, to do that in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know what my dream project would be, but I know that the dream would be to be able to have that much bravery <laughs> to be yeah. able to, to step in and, and say, this is me. Cause that's another thing about what I do, right? Like, and Clint said it beautifully as a ranger and orchestrator, like I, I'm like behind the scenes, right? And I'm, I'm grateful that someone like Lin Manuel will call my name out and bring me along for projects and, and have me stand next to him. But 
you know, at the end of the day, it's Lynn's songs, right? I'm serving what it is that he does. And, you know, when people work in musical theater, like it's very rare that they will single out the orchestrations for tanking the show or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's much easier to point at that. So the fact that Clint has everything in his head and that is all a representation of him, right? And his mm -hmm. voice and his writing and his ability, like that, that is so, again, beautiful is the word that I think about because I think about what kind of courage it takes a step into that light and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is how I sound. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, a, a, you know, I, I, I said that would be my dream project to be able to like have that, that the ability to stand up and, and say, hey, this is me. Well, uh, I, I, think, I think that it takes a lot of courage to be an artist of any stripe today. Mm -hmm. And I think you're both taking that leap into the air to use that an analogy, uh, Alex. And I just am so grateful for you guys spending uh, some time with me today and uh, talking about this. I, 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 could, I could honestly, I could do this for another two hours. Uh, okay. You know, I, I just think this is the most interesting conversation. And, and to an extent, you know, you're talking about being behind the scenes. Yeah, there is that aspect, but, um, you know, at the same time, what a, what a, what a, important part of people's experience with any sort of musical form you know it i mean if if you know if billy joel played electric guitar instead of piano think about those songs i mean the lyrics would be strange to begin with but um you, you know or or uh, you know bon jovi is an all keyboard band you know it just wouldn't it just wouldn't make sense um and and our our emotional experience with both of your works are so influenced by the way you spread that sound out over a group of players and bring it to life. So I, I, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, what, what's coming up next uh, for you guys? I know Clint, you know, we still have you in Copper Queen land for a while, uh, <laughs> but, but what, what else are you working on right now that you want to share with folks? Uh, I just actually finished, and this kind of goes back to what Alex was saying, like you live with an opera for, years sometimes and it's kind of really sad like when you finish it up like when I finished the last notes orchestrating the Copper Queen whenever it was kind of recently right yeah. I was kind of like oh my god it's like that whole world is completely gone and it's kind of like a breakup it's like mm -hmm. now I'm gonna hear it but right now when when I hear it I'm not gonna feel like it's mine I'm gonna feel like it's like yours and you know Cecilia's the singers the conductor for me now it's gone it's like it's your baby now right. whatever but um, I'm, I, I just finished uh, a Christmas opera called The Christmas Spider. And I'm currently working on it with the American Opera Project here in New York City. Very cool. We have a workshop coming up and Minnesota Opera is gonna do the carol on their Christmas concert this year. That's so awesome. I just finished that too, so that's another baby. So my friend. Right. Well, I, I would be remiss not to, not to say on that note, thank you for trusting us with your baby, the Copper Queen. Cause you know, in the same way that a composer, you know, comes to Alex and says, you know, here's this thing, I need your help, you know, raising this child. Uh, you're, 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 you're having that leap of faith moment with us at the point at which you complete the score. And, and uh, thank you for entrusting us with that. That's super special. Uh, Alex, what about you? What's, what's next on your list? I, I know you have your hands full with some projects. Yeah, I, I've been fortunate that I've been uh, working on movie projects. Uh, and uh, the In the Heights movie, uh, we were still working on that even during the pandemic, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Dear Evan Hansen movie has been shooting in Atlanta, and I've been working on that remotely. Uh, a couple of other projects for things that are slated to be released next year. Um, but uh, th that's been fun. And, you know, my heart breaks that we are not actually in theaters performing, that Broadway is not a thing right now, that, yeah. that yeah. performances are not happening right now. And, and um, so I, I count my blessings in, in that, that I'm still uh, finding spaces to be creative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's not the case for everybody. So I, I, you know, that's not lost on me that I'm very, very lucky to be able to do that. But um, yeah, those are the things that are, are keeping me busy during, a, during the current shutdown. Yeah, indeed. Well, you know, just, just to say it, uh, we are living in this remarkable point in time, even though this, this video series will endure beyond this crisis. I think, you know, just from my point of view, I love the fact that we do have the opportunity to share works like uh, the Copper Queen or that In the Heights is, is uh, you know, is still coming out and that we get the medium of film and as a way to share our work. Uh, but of course, that live theater experience, the, the communal energy that we get to feel when we are together enjoying this work, there's nothing that can replace it. And I, I'm just 100% certain that that time is coming back. 
you know, we just got to hang in there and uh, stay safe and wear our masks and keep distance, but um, it, it's going to come back. We're going to, we're going to get to um, do this work together in theaters again. And, uh, I, and I can't wait for it. I know you guys feel the same way. Same. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this first, uh, this first episode of Unmiked and taking a chance on a, on a newbie uh, um, video series host. It really means a lot to me guys to have you on here. And, and again, uh, you know, if, if we can book a, an opera length, you know, three hour block sometime to, to do this again, I'll, I'll love it. it this has um, just been great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. It's good to chat with you, Clint. Great job, man. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Unmiked, where we blur the edges that connect the world of opera to just about everything else. A new episode will be released each month, so be sure to check our website, azopera.org, join our email list, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. <laughs> Unmiked is a part of Arizona Opera's Connection Lab program a new series of digital and public offerings designed to facilitate a connection between Arizona communities familiar with our company, as well as opera goers and others well beyond our state. Arizona Opera is grateful to our lead digital sponsors for the 2020-21 season, Ron and Kay McDougall. Arizona Opera's next-gen programs are made possible through the support of Karen Fruin, Roma Whitkoff, Jeanette J. Siegel, the Valentine Family Foundation, APS, and Jody Paluzzi. To learn more about the programs that are part of Arizona Opera Next Gen, please visit us online at easyopera.org.